Good evening. Thank you for joining us for tonight's educational webinar on Getting Your Feet Beach Ready. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Ralph Napolitano, Jr., podiatrist and director of wound care and healing at OrthoNeuro. Dr. Napolitano is a double board certified podiatrist and wound care physician specializing in medicine, surgery, and wound care of the foot, ankle, and lower limb. Dr. Napolitano's area of clinical interest include medical and surgical care of the foot and ankle, general wound care and healing, diabetic foot wounds, lower limb surgical salvage, management of surgical wound complications, aesthetic podiatry, and laser care. Dr. Napolitano? Heather, thank you very much. And thank all of, and thanks to all of you for joining us this evening. Uh, it's, it's so nice that we have this beautiful spring weather here in central Ohio. It's, uh, well, it's not very nice. A patient of mine said, I think we're getting March weather now in April. So uh, perhaps we are, although we can think of uh, warmer weather with our topic tonight. So again, we appreciate you joining in. So getting your feet beach ready, there is still time. Uh, we might be past spring break, but uh, summer is around the corner. So again, uh, thank you. I'm uh, Director of Wound Care and Healing with Ortho Neuro, and my special area is the lower limb, so foot, ankle, and lower leg. We look at our extremities, facts here. The lowly uh, foot, the humble foot, is a pretty complicated uh, machine. In fact, Da Vinci called it a masterpiece, uh, this foot. We have 26 bones, 33 joints, over 100 tendons, and ligaments that work in concert to keep us moving and keep us grounded to uh, earth here. Uh, where there is gravity, of course, there are problems with our feet, and that's what we'll talk about today. Um, uh, not such an appetizing fact here, but feet produce half a pint of perspiration daily in their sweat glands. That's important. Uh, the average person will walk the earth four times. So you think about how many steps we take in a day, a week, a month, a year, that's a lot. So gravity certainly pay, plays, a, plays a role in um, foot pathology. Uh, women experience foot problems about four times more than men. And nine out of 10 women wear shoes that are too small. So you think there might be a correlation there? I think there might be. But men, of course, wear ill-fitting shoes too. So if we look at our skin, okay, the thickest skin in our body is the soles of our feet, also our back too. So um, there are lots of problems that we deal with as podiatrists with respect to uh, skin problems on the bottom of that foot. Uh, this uh, ground reactive force that I alluded to, this gravity, uh, all that plays a role as we ambulate, as we walk, and shear forces and gravity. If uh, things aren't in a proper alignment, that, um, that uh, ground reactive force and these shear forces really can wreak havoc on our feet. If we uh, remember physics, uh, that discussion uh, that your teachers had at one point about vectors, vectors have force and direction. If something is pulling incorrectly, that can cause a significant uh, malalignment if you will, and that gets accentuated over time. We're going to uh, talk about common things today. All of us that uh, have foot problems um, know uh, certainly uh, when we need to uh, maybe seek medical attention and maybe not, but we're going to unpack that. But we certainly know that there's something wrong because we can't really escape a foot problem. We have to move throughout the day. Uh, being active is certainly very important. So this gentleman, you might remember the king of late night, uh, Dave Letterman had his top 10 list. We're not going to quite uh, go that far, but we're going to talk about uh, the top uh, common foot problems. So kind of starting from the outside in, uh, the toenail, okay? Um, this uh, appendage is important for protection, and it's just part of who we are, and it certainly can uh, be a, a bane of, uh, of, of problems when we have toenails that grow incorrectly, or dare I say, that have toenail fungus unsightly, and, and certainly a, an infection, a, uh, a medical condition that does need treated. Uh, risk factors for getting toenail uh, fungus is certainly um, aging, okay, familial history, all right, uh, sweaty environment, uh, hyperhidrosis, that's the condition where, where feet sweat excessively, environmental exposure, and uh, things that affect the whole person can affect uh, the toenail, so an immunocompromised individual. Also being male, we see a little bit of uh, predilection as, as men um, being at risk for this, and half of us, by the time we're 70, will be diagnosed with this problem, so it's certainly very common. Um, these microscopic plants that are fungi, if you will. We have some 
long names here that you can uh, memorize. And maybe if these questions come up on Jeopardy, you'll know. Uh, also yeast, uh, condition um, candidiasis, the candidate yeast, um, a mold uh, type of organism uh, can affect the tummy. And people, again, that are uh, immunocompromised, that have a chink in their immune system because of medical conditions or, or cancer patients undergoing chemotherapy are uh, exposed uh, a, a little bit more and or are predisposed to get this condition uh, a little bit easier. We used to have to uh, grow and, um, and get rid of, or I should say grow and kill fungus in the laboratory setting to confirm a diagnosis. But today we now have genetic testing, this polymerase chain reaction test, where we're able to find out if we have fungal involvement much quicker in, in a week or so. So what does this look like? I think I have some photographs in this uh, in slideshow here, but uh, signs and symptoms, we have thickening of the toenail, uh, deformity, it's yellow, uh, it's dark colored, or it's really just very unsightly, okay? Other things that can cause the toenail to look like this, psoriasis, very hard to tell sometimes, whether you have a, what we call psoriatic toenail versus one that's affected by toenail fungus. Uh, traumatic injury can cause a toenail to grow uh, incorrectly, a condition called lichen planus, uh, cutaneous uh, melanoma, all of these things. So, and as reference, <clears throat> people with uh, immunocompromised and certain systemic conditions, diabetes, circulatory problems, immune defects, all these can make folks a little bit more susceptible to toenail fungus. So left untreated, uh, this can cause permanent toenail damage. So we might be able to get rid of the fungus, but we still have that unsightly thickened toenail, okay? So this is a little uh, pictorial uh, demonstration of what a normal toenail looks like to the left, that, that second toe versus a more milder presentation of fungus versus a very severe uh, condition where we have thickening and yellow and then the deformity of that toe. You get an incurvated nail where that can actually pinch the skin and ingrown toenail, which is also very common. We work with that a lot. We work with neuro in private practice. The, uh, the picture on the bottom right definitely shows a very impressive uh, thickening type presentation of those toenails. So how do we get rid of this? Well, prompt intervention is very important. So the quicker we can get at this, the better the likelihood we'll get this cleared. We like to get this treated within six months to a year. So again, um, if this goes untreated, that toenail can get damaged. So we have oral antibiotics to get rid of uh, bacterial infections. With fungal infections, we have oral antifungals, okay? Uh, there is also topicals, all right, that have been beneficial more so over recent years. Um, they don't have uh, side effects nearly as often as, as oral agents. So just a little discussion about that. Oral antifungals, you can uh, have some side effects that can affect you, uh, some liver problems, uh, some other issues. It's not very common, but it is a possibility. Your topicals, because they're, well, topical, there's no uh, systemic side effects. Um, the latest generation of these, aphenokinazole, it looks like, um, uh, well, it's a, like a clear uh, medicine, and the applicator looks like a, uh, a little brush. And by just simply brushing uh, this medicine on, it penetrates very well. And that's really why this medication shines quite well today. It uh, penetrates the nail. Um, very well and even penetrates painted toenails. So uh, for our lady patients that want to paint their toenails, uh, that medicine can uh, penetrate right through that painted toenail. We do laser at orthomero. That's a um, good technique. There's no side effects with that. And a lot of patients choose to do topical with laser. It's a very good uh, combination. The uh, laser um, uses heat and light energy. And lasers and medicine do lots of different things. They do everything from, well, treating toenails to uh, removing hair to using them in the operative theater where we do different things uh, with abdominal surgery, et cetera. So uh, with this, uh, healthy tissue is spared, okay? We're just treating that affected nail plate. We don't need to surgically do anything, no removal. Uh, our laser is also FDA cleared to treat uh, uh, warts and uh, thick, uh, unsightly scars. And this shows a little demonstration, a little picture series that is a before and after uh, with laser. So you can appreciate normal nail plate growth, uh, thinning of that toenail, 
and uh, just an overall healthy appearing uh, toning. Um, with our laser, OrthoNeuro, uh, it's a six month uh, treatment where you're treated uh, once uh, a month for six months. And as that toenail grows, which happens to be a millimeter or two a month, that's the average toenail growth pat pattern in, in adults, that's where we'll start to see in about three months healthier toenail push out. So it's not too late if you have this problem to get started as your feet are, are out there in the sun and have healthier looking toenails. And as referenced earlier, this combination of treating uh, uh, toenail fungus topically as well as with laser, laser is a very popular um, method. Now, uh, discomfort is a uh, reality with laser. Um, it doesn't require anesthesia. We need patients to be able to, to feel what we're doing. Uh, it gets a little warm, uh, but that subsides instantaneously. So as we're moving along that toenail plate, we gauge how many pulses we're delivering and uh, patient comfort and can adjust things accordingly. Treatment overall, if we're treating all 10 toenails, in one session, it takes only a few minutes. So it's, it's not a long endeavor. Okay. Now, with respect to uh, cosmetic things, uh, we do a technique called Curiflex Nail Restoration. This is strictly for uh, cosmetic purposes. This doesn't uh, improve nail health at all, uh, but it is a polymer, a medical grade polymer that we apply we shape in, in the form of a toenail. So it's uh, a step beyond what we would have at a nail salon, or your esthetician does, because it's a medical grade uh, procedure uh, that we do. Uh, some folks have just damaged toenails that are beyond repair from a crush injury, et cetera. And this is what we do with this. This takes a little bit longer, about 15 minutes to do. And we literally uh, trim down the, the dystrophic, the deformed part of the toenail and reshape uh, a toenail using this polymer, okay? It stays on for about two and a half months. And if you do have a nail that grows a little bit, as it grows out, that toenail, uh, the synthetic one will, will fail and you have to reapply. We use a, water, a waterproof sealant, this can be painted, and the results are really pretty good. So as you can see, um, the result here of the Curiflex uh, synthetic uh, toenail on the right and the uh, deformed toenail on the left. Okay. So continuing on with uh, skin things, uh, it certainly can um, affect the foot. We have athletes foot, very common problem. Um, this is caused by microscopic plants that are fungi. Some names of these are listed, trichophyton, the family of fungus that is most common. Uh, the uh, signs and symptoms, those of us that have athlete's foot are uh, familiar with this dry, scaling skin, cracking, uh, that area between the sole of the foot and just as the foot um, sort of almost meets uh, the top, we call that the sulial line, that's where we see uh, these changes, blistering, uh, a vesicular, as we say, type presentation um, can uh, all be uh, things to look for with athlete's foot. Advanced cases, you can get a dual bacterial infection. Now, uh, if you remember our history, that's kind of how penicillin was developed, where bacteria and fungus don't get along in the laboratory. Um, the scientists that developed uh, penicillin saw that. So in advanced cases or in the patient that is immunocompromised, you can get a, a dual bacterial and fungus infection. So athletes go with a bacteria, which is uh, certainly uh, not a good thing to deal with. This can spread to toenails and vice versa. So athlete's foot can be a reservoir for toenail fungus and toenail fungus can be a reservoir for athlete's foot. Again, we're referencing our patients with underlying health conditions, diabetes, circulatory issues, immune problems are, are more prone uh, to this uh, problem. Uh, athlete's foot, uh, differential things, what else can be going? Well, um, certain uh, other skin conditions, uh, again, like in planus, um, psoriasis, all these can mimic um, athlete's foot. And we see this between the toes, this chronic scaly type presentation, a dry uh, uh, plantar bottom of the foot type presentation. These could ulcerate uh, these athlete's foot infections, and you can get the uh, little bubbles of blisters, the vesicular type presentation. So this is what this looks like. The upper right-hand photograph, a little bit more benign presentation, just uh, scaling and peeling versus that center foot. 
on the picture where you have profound thickening and uh, fissures that are so uncomfortable. Uh, this itches, it's just not, not fun to deal with. So how do we uh, treat this? Well, prevention, okay, um, is certainly important. So we're not getting it in the first place, which is kind of a celebration of the obvious, if you will, but um, watching where you go and, and your bare feet. So uh, gym shower floors, wearing sandals or flip-flops, important. Um, public pools, we're not as much concerned about that because such such environments are, are treated chemically, but anywhere where there's a lot of feet, uh, gathering, you're, you're predisposed to uh, having this sort of problem spread. So prevention, uh, very important. Oral medications for more advanced cases, a shorter course of antifungal therapy compared to a longer course with tonia fungus. Um, topicals really carry the day, though. That's our mainstay of treatment. We can use this in combination with the steroid as well. Um, we talked about prevention. So not only in my practice, I might have mentioned this earlier, do I, earlier do I talk about foot health, but I talk about shoe and sock health. Where do our feet live? So it's important uh, to take care of that, that shoe environment. So with socks, laundering them uh, appropriately, just common sense type things, using a bleach alternative is uh, very good. Uh, shoes, um, rotating shoes, not wearing the same pair of shoes for, for days on end, if you will and doing something for your shoes, a simple anti-fungal um, spray, um, antimicrobial spray. They even have on the market, which I've advocated now for several years, an ultraviolet light shoe sanitizer. It looks like a shoe tree. Uh, I'll give a, a plug for shoe trees. Uh, they're, uh, the best kind are cedar, and they'll absorb moisture. So that prolongs the life of your shoe and helps that environment where uh, your feet live which is different than the ultraviolet light shoe sanitizer, but it's the same concept, um, helping that shoe environment be uh, as healthy as possible. So moving on, we're still at the level of the skin, ingrown toenails, very common. We see this in kids, we see this in infants, we see this in adult folks. This is a condition in which the nail curves in, causing pressure and pain, on the surrounding soft tissue that can actually puncture the skin, resulting in an, inf in an infection. And um, what we what we do to get rid of that is obviously removing that portion either temporarily or permanently. Uh, this can be caused by an injury, okay, or a chronic condition from nail deformity, ill-fitting shoe gear, okay. Um, in my practice, treating a lot of athletes, high school athletes, college athletes, cliques are not. Uh, the most foot friendly, we should work to develop a little bit uh, better uh, cleat style, but depending on what sport the athlete plays, some cleats can be uh, worse than others. A little bit of uh, toenail anatomy. So our, our nail fold is the skin that's around the uh, outer edge of the nail. Uh, the nail plate, of course, is what we all know of a toenail, uh, what, what that is. We have a proximal nail fold, the skin proximally and uh, distally. Uh, we call we call that area the uh, onychodermal band, where we see the the juncture of the nail plate, meaning that undersurface of the skin. That's the uh, the nail bed. So the uh, most common place for ingrown toenails to occur is the great toe. We see them in lesser toenails, but the great toe is the most common, either on the inside or the outside of that nail border. We say the the medial or lateral, depending on whether it's on the outside of the midline of the body or towards the inside. And this is presentation uh, 101, if you will, with what ingrown toenails look like. You have everything from just benign incurvation to a very significant problem where you have that, what we call granulomatous or proud flesh is an old term, uh, infectious changes. We have that bubbling up of tissue, that's very painful. Um, Teenage boys, I have one, I can speak uh, to this. They're notorious for letting things go and not telling mom and dad. I've had patients that have had these for you know a year and a half and they look like that photograph on the right. So obviously that's an infection that needs to be treated um, promptly and surgically. So uh, as stated earlier, how we get rid of this is remove the offending nail border. Now, typically I won't do a permanent type procedure if someone just has an initial a case of this. Maybe they trimmed their toenail incorrectly and it, it plowed into the side of that nail fold. 
Uh, if this continues, we can do a very successful procedure where we actually uh, get rid of the root of the nail on the side. So we're preserving a nice cosmetic result, um, but still uh, doing an effective treatment. So the nail, if you look really closely on a toenail that has had toenail surgery, it might look a little straighter, but, but barely noticeable, if you will, in a negative fashion. In fact, I'll suggest versus an incurvated toenail, this will look much more um, healthy and, and much more normal with that nail plate uh, being uh, straighter. So cos cosmetic um, things in my practice are very important, even though it's your feet and toes, we want things to look as normal as possible. Uh, supportive antibiotic care and it goes hand in hand with an infected toenail and routine maintenance, avoid excessive rounding. Now, we tell patients you can round your toenails a little bit, but we want to avoid excessive rounding. So if you round that toenail too much, that side can plow into that, um, that nail fold. Tight-fitting shoe gear uh, is also a uh, predisposing factor. So ladies that like heels with narrower toe boxes, everything in moderation, I say. Uh, so we just want to be cognizant and not live in such shoe gear for uh, a long time. So rotating your shoes will certainly help predispose or help prevent uh, predisposition for uh, ingrown toenails. A little pictorial um, a setup of what a toenail surgery looks like. So of course we do this under local anesthesia. And I will say the overwhelming majority of patients we do this right in the office. A little bit of uh, discomfort with an injection into the toe, but it's like a dental procedure except it happens to be a toe, uh, where you're numbing that toe and you can remove that offending nail border, either uh, temporarily or permanently. And then we apply a medication, typically phenol, which is an acid at the nail bed, so that side of that toenail doesn't grow down and in. Uh, recovery, uh, pretty painless recovery. You're uncomfortable for a couple of days, but from a slightly bulkier bandage, Immediately, uh, postoperatively, that I have patients uh, wear for, for about a day. Then they're down to a simple um, simple fabric Band-Aid and roughly normal shoes. About two weeks, um, we're well on your way to not knowing when I did this. Um, since we're talking about the beach and uh, warm weather and fun in the sun and swimming, uh, chlorinated uh, water sources, um, I typically allow patients to do that in a few days. Natural water sources, I'm a little bit more stringent. So a week to 10 days, uh, depending. I follow people up in, uh, in 10 to 14 days after we do this procedure to make sure they're doing well. Um, a, a regrowth of this uh, ingrown toenail uh, recurrence is uncommon. About 5% of the time, give or take in the literature, we'll get a recurrence, in which case we can just redo this procedure. Um, I mentioned a chemical treatment. There's also a surgical treatment, which this is surgery by itself, but a surgical treatment where we excise a little bit closer to the phalanx bone where that nail matrix is, and that requires suturing. That's slightly more involved, and we do that in an operating room. But uh, that's um, a secondary uh, procedure that we consider only if someone fails this procedure a couple of times. So again, this is an office procedure, uh, very easy to do recovery very quick, and most often we don't need the operator. Again, another presentation there, before and after. So you can appreciate architecturally, on the left, you see the incurvated nail borders, and then on the right is after surgery, it shows that straighter toenail cosmetically. I'll suggest again, that looks uh, better in the picture on the left, regardless of that infection. Okay, so still sticking with the skin here, Plantar roots. Why do we say plantars? Because they're on the bottom, the plantar surface of the foot. These are benign viral infections that are cauliflower like, so they can look lumpy. Uh, the black dots that we see in warts, we can, uh, the vernacular, the, the seeds of the wart, those are actually little thrombos clotted off capillaries where the um, virus is uh, fighting the immune system of the patient. So that's actually a vascular network of what's going on here. These uh, can be painful if they're on a weight-bearing surface. In general, uh, oddly enough, these tend to go away, but they may grow and multiply before resolution can take years. So most often people uh, opt for treatment. This is what these look like. The picture on the left is a mosaic type plantar wart presentation. The uh, picture on the right is uh, more of a, a solitary cluster of uh, warts. 
So we can topically treat these, or we can use laser, our same laser that we showed everyone earlier. Um, that uh, technology certainly works very well for laser uh, or for warts. Um, we can even do an excision procedure where we uh, excise uh, the wart under local anesthesia and use a chemical uh, or an electrocautery uh, to cauterize that uh, warty infected, virally infected tissue. Um, so that's our um, infectious discussion, if you will. I think we're going to transition to um, corns and calluses, also unsightly, also um, not fun to deal with. These are thickened areas on the skin, the foot um, and toes that result from pressure. So shoe gear, foot deformities, how a person walks. So it's the body's way to protect getting an open sore. Okay. And these are what these look like. So uh, we'll talk about toe deformities a little bit later, but uh, you can appreciate that we have some crooked toes up there. The picture on the left, these are our hammer toes, where the joint just beyond the ball of foot joint is contracted and up in the air. We have a variation of this that I'll show a little bit later called, called a claw toe. Uh, and then there's a one that's even different that's called a mallet toe. And this is all just how the toe is bent and deformed. So Corns are on the top, calluses are on the bottom. Calluses and corns can even affect between the toes, which can be uh, certainly aggravating and uncomfortable. So treatment includes palliation, where we're just simply uh, keeping that uh, skin uh, trimmed down, if you will. I've had patients ask from time to time, can you just cut this out and get rid of it? Well, we can, but if we don't remove why the cause, uh, why this happened in the first place, remove that, that causative um, uh, etiology, then they're going to continue to grow this thickened skin either on the bottom or top of the foot. So uh, preventive measures, all right, include looking at foot deformities, surgically correcting them as appropriate, uh, offloading, the concept of taking pressure off of the affected area. So shoe inserts, uh, depending on the level of where that corner canvas is, avoiding offending shoe gear, um, and, and looking at biomechanics, you know, maybe there's some stretching that we can help uh, that person um, have a little bit better foot control, okay? Um, gait analysis we do with frequency in, in the office setting. So that is corns and calluses. So segueing on to maybe why we get corns and calluses are these foot deformities, so bunions and hammer toes. So uh, obviously not sightly and, and not a... Um, uh, certainly a simple problem. You know, we referenced talking about um, how people walk this earth four times. Well, if we have abnormal biomechanics, this is accentuated daily when we're walking and we can get these, these digital deformities of the great toe and lesser toes. So how we get these problems is an imbalance of the tendons and ligaments that move toes and feet up and down. If we have uh, this situation over time, we get these deformities. Uh, we walk on this earth with gravity, and gravity we're constantly fighting, so things tend to collapse. When joints are malaligned, a more significant malalignment, we call that subluxation. And we can appreciate that at the bottom right hand of the photograph. We have toes that are overlapping that big toe, very serious problem. Uh, bunion deformity on the far left is a more a milder type presentation, but nonetheless, um, is significant enough for shoe gear um, is uh, a problem. So most often people notice that all my shoes aren't fitting correctly and they see this bump that gradually develops. The joint isn't always uncomfortable as the body adapts. You get an, uh, an, adapt, an adaptation of that cartilage, how that joint bends. So you won't necessarily be uncomfortable without shoes, but with shoe gear on, if shoes aren't fitting correctly, you can appreciate where you would get uh, rubbing and friction and uh, problems. Some x-rays here. Uh, the x-rays on the left shows uh, bunion deformity. That's a malalignment of the great toe joint. Uh, the ball of the foot bones are called metatarsals. And when we have uh, that metatarsal drifting in, that causes the big toe to turn the other way. That big toe can even rotate. So the technical term for a bunion is a hallux abducto valgus. So that means that joint is malaligned and the big toe is turning in with that metatarsal going the other way. And I referenced uh, a condition called subluxation. We actually have a dislocated second toe 
um, on uh, the picture on the right, you can see that that phalanx bone, that's a term for uh, the small bones in toes, is actually overriding that metatarsal, um, that second metatarsal. I'd, I'd suggest that in this patient, they're probably getting a callus beneath that second metatarsal head because shoe gear is causing that toe to press down and certainly cause uh, thickening of that uh, surface of skin on the bottom below where that metatarsal is. Okay, so how do we treat bunions and hammer toes? So there's really no conservative way to uh, treat the actual deformity. You kind of live with it or you have to fix it surgically. Uh, to accommodate uh, those, those conditions, shoe gear and activity modification, so wearing wider shoes, um, which is kind of an obvious thing, or having shoes stretched can help a problem area. Uh, a good cobbler can do this, and they're out there uh, definitely. They, they, they uh, are doing uh, good work, and, and they have not gone away. That trade actually is making a, a bit of a resurgence. Um, my, uh, my grandparents, my grandfather, um, was a cobbler, and uh, great-grandfather actually uh, took care of uh, Bess Truman, made her wedding shoes. So that's a discussion for another uh, webinar. So uh, shoe gear um, is certainly near and dear to me, and wearing the right, um, correct shoe gear, and uh, shoe gear that's made well is very important. So uh, anyway, uh, shoe gear modification and wearing the right uh, shoes that fit well can accommodate these uh, deformities. To treat the corns and calluses, we talked about reducing pressure, palliative care that we do in the office for folks that, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what happened there. Um, let's see. Excuse me. Okay. I'll be right with you, folks. So let's see what we did here. Technology, right? Okay, I think that's good. All right, excuse me, I have no idea what happened there. Um, but anyway, um, regarding um, palliative care, that's a professional podiatry service that we do for folks that um, aren't exactly as able-bodied to take care of their own feet. We trim toenails, we reduce corns and calluses, this is something that insurance is paid for every couple of months. Uh, I do have some patients that come more frequently. That's a small out-of-pocket expense, but it's certainly a value uh, to them. So uh, anyway, uh, palliation, so accommodation. These are conservative things. If a uh, bunion or hammer toe is inflamed, these uh, advanced cases require arthritis medications, anti-inflammatories, uh, topical pain creams can be of benefit, but Really, it's living with the problem, so you can't live with it anymore. And then surgery is um, what we would need to do. Um, I'm not sure why. I'm not able to advance. So, excuse me. There we go. Okay. All right. There we go. I have, I have control now. So. This is an example of some hammer toe pads. Um, so um, this is um, an example of how we uh, can accommodate uh, areas that are um, inflamed or that rub in shoes. Uh, so we use these uh, digital um, accommodative devices here. Um, I'm going to check one thing here uh, to make sure uh, I don't need to do anything else. We're having a little bit of technical uh, difficulty here. Uh, checking with Heather. Uh, another message into Heather there. Um, So okay. prevention, okay, wearing the right size shoes can certainly um, help accommodate bunion and hammer toe deformities. Um, they can uh, make a problem worse. So if you're more prone 
to abundance from genetics or heredity, uh, where an ill-fitting shoe gear will make this problem uh, worse. So um, I'm getting a message back from Heather. Okay, looks like we're back. Okay, here we go. So um, I think we're moving along okay. So um, just making sure we're doing what we need to do here. All right. So um, arch support. So bringing the floor up to the foot uh, is something that we do with custom arch support. So as referenced earlier, we talk about um, fighting uh, gravity. Okay. So bringing that floor up to the foot uh, certainly um, can prevent biomechanics from going awry. Uh, genetics also uh, plays a role as referenced. So um, surgery. The only way to truly correct the bunion deformity, and we can't really um, put back uh, a bunion conservatively with any kind of splinting or stretching, et cetera. So we uh, do a combination of things in the operating room. We remove that medial part, that inside part, and the metatarsal head, and then we balance things by aligning the joint. There's various ways to fix a bunion. Um, hammer toes, the same sort of thing. Uh, we're removing part of the joint that's malaligned, and then we can temporarily uh, pin the uh, toe with external fixation, which comes out later. There's even internal fixation uh, for uh, hammer toes that uh, stays in the foot. Um, the uh, photograph, um, the radiograph on the right shows that uh, internal fixation option. Uh, the photograph in the middle shows uh, a bunion uh, fixated with the plate and some screws, and then hammer toe temporary um, fixation with uh, these are called Kirschner wires. They're uh, small uh, wires that are very thin that just hold that toe temporarily in place, and uh, those are removed and really uh, pain free removal. Um, stitches. I have patients say that stitches hurt a lot worse, even though they don't hurt very much, than removing uh, the pins that are smooth in the office. Okay. Um, tendinitis. So tendinitis is uh, an overuse of a body part where tendons are part of uh, the construct that cross a joint. And if we have something that's pulling abnormal or we have uh, undue stress that can cause inflammation of that tendon. So weakness or an instability uh, can certainly uh, pre be predisposing. So um, if we have the tendon sheath, which is the uh, covering over a tendon that gets inflamed, we call that tenosynovitis. Um, we can see this more of an overused type gradual presentation or more of an acute time frame where we have a weekend warrior type of person that's training for a half marathon and pushes it too much over you know, a Sunday, and then we have an inflammation of the tendon. In the foot and ankle, the most common tendons that are involved are the Achilles tendon, which is the strongest tendon in the body as well as the posterior tibial tendon, which its job is uh, to create the arch to help create that arch structure and preserve how that arch functions. A little bit of anatomy here, that Achilles tendon is on the back portion where that hooks into the back of the heel. Uh, there's an area called the watershed region, which is not, it doesn't have the best blood supply. And that's the area that's just about um, an inch and a half or so above where the um, tendon hooks into that heel bone. That's the area that where we want to get where, where we're going to get tendonitis. That's the area that's prone to uh, inflammation. And if we're going to have a rupture, that's the area that um, is prone to rupture. So uh, that watershed area we have to protect. Stretching is very important for activities uh, to keep that area limber and healthy. Uh, that posterior tibial tendon is on the inside of the arch that um, crosses uh, underneath and uh, helps create that arch and helps bring the foot down and in and resulting in kind of uh, an opposite motion of keeping that arch elevated. Okay. Um, Anti-inflammatories and or steroids, depending injections, we have to be very careful. These are treatment options. We got to be very judicious about where we inject um, we typically avoid 
the uh, Achilles in the foot. Sometimes you inject uh, other areas, but uh, the Achilles we usually uh, stay away from. Uh, shoe gear and activity modification also mainstays of treatment and mobilization depending on the severity and controlling abnormal biomechanics with uh, orthotics, possibly surgery dependent. Now, some of you might be saying, you didn't mention the plantar fascia or plantar fasciitis. You're right, I did not. Kind of a subset of tendonitis. The plantar fascia is really a ligament. It's not a tendon. Tendons connect muscle to bone. Ligaments connect uh, bone to bone. So the plantar fascia, we want to be real technical, it's called an aponeurosis, where this kind of fans out from the heel bone and um, goes into the toes. And this area is very prone to inflammation where it originates on the heel. Very classic and typical, those that have had plantar fasciitis, uh, pain after a sedentary um, period. So after arising in the morning, after you've sat at work and you get up, you'll, you'll, you'll feel this uh, uncomfortable uh, pain in the bottom of the foot at the heel. A flatter foot type is more predisposed to plantar fasciitis, but even a higher arch foot can uh, be um, a cause of plantar fasciitis. Trauma, um, shoes with lack of arch support, certain activities, weight bearing, uh, patient's weight, et cetera, can all be um, predisposing factors. So this is the area that gets inflamed. Now, uh, heel spurs, we'll kind of demystify this. I'll tell you a little antidote. Joe DiMaggio, okay? Uh, heel spur actually was very problematic for his career. And really, as some will argue that this uh, was the cause of uh, his uh, career ending um, uh, time frame. He had this um, plantar heel spur. And at the time, they thought it was the spur that was causing the problem. It really wasn't. It was the plantar fascia. So in his case, okay, he had a surgery to remove the heel spur, which resulted in this painful scar, which he wasn't quite right uh, afterwards in trying to play baseball with a painful scar on the bottom of the foot, not real conducive. What we have learned over many years, many years ago, we learned this, um, that the spur is a result of the problem. So it's like the chicken or the egg. The plantar fascia pulls on that heel bone, causing uh, that heel spur to grow. So focusing on breaking the cycle of inflammation, mainstay of treatment and preventing it from coming back, uh, stretches, anti-inflammatories. This is an area we can inject safely and we do this with frequency. It helps quite a bit. Orthotics and night splints. So a night splint is a contraction that you wear at night. It helps hold your foot at 90 degrees. It prevents your foot from contracting in that uh, heel cord, that Achilles from contracting. Surgery, um, we can release part of that fascia. There's also a condition uh, where we get a tight heel cord it's called equinus. And that's, um, you know, from the uh, Latin for, for horse, if you think of how a horse's leg is shaped. So that equinus contracture, we have to outmaneuver that to uh, help with um preventing those abnormal biomechanics. So sometimes surgery is done to help lengthen that Achilles or to help lengthen that calf muscle to alleviate some of those stresses and contraction. Um, so surgery focuses around that. Now there's a, a technique called extracorporeal shockwave therapy in which we use a high energy ultrasound to deliver um, an anti-inflammatory modality uh, to that inflamed uh, heal. And it's really not a fun sounding name, but extracorporeal means outside the body. So it's not surgical. And it's shockwave because we're using high energy ultrasound. This is the same technology that they use to break up kidney stones. And this is what this looks like. This is uh, an office procedure, maybe outpatient dependent. Uh, this technology, although very good, isn't the most accessible because of, frankly, insurance reimbursement and some other hurdles. But uh, it's a case by case basis. And a lot of times we can get this treatment uh, when needed. Okay, so in wrapping things up, before we go on to some questions, um, if we're talking about the skin of our feet and our toenails, common sense. Thing. So avoiding uh, trimming our toenails too close, frowning them, um, being hygienic, okay, shoe and sock health, not just foot health. Those of us that excessively uh, perspire, that can be a predisposition to athlete's foot fungal infections. So controlling that excessive perspiration, there's certain products topically that can help with this. 
and the importance of wearing well-made, properly fitting shoes cannot be overstated. So that's near and dear to my heart, as I talked about earlier. A um, little nod to get buying shoes. You might have heard this, buying shoes towards the end of the day as we are walking, as our feet are in dependency, they'll be a little bit uh, larger, a little bit more swollen. So going to buy shoes uh, towards the end of the day will give you a more accurate picture. Um, you don't want to have a shoe that's too big, but certainly a shoe that's too small is uh, bad practice. Also, fitting your longest toe, it's usually your second toe, it could be your first toe, but having that longest toe be accommodated by appropriate uh, fitting shoe gear. Uh, daily self exams for folks that have diabetes, that don't have sensation for different reasons, that protective sensation is lost. Circulatory patients, patients with peripheral arterial disease, very important for them to inspect their feet daily. Folks that are a little bit older, you know, having mobility, very, very important. So for protection in public places, we talked about wearing uh, gym shoes, or uh, I should say, pardon me, uh, sandals or like slides, flip-flops when we're taking showers in public places, uh, shoe and sock health as referenced. Uh, preventive measures, okay, and promptly addressing uh, foot problems before they get out of control. Uh, those that go to nail salons, I just say pedicure awareness. You know, if the establishment doesn't feel right to you, doesn't look clean, then uh, then promptly leave. Okay. Um, again, shoe tips: know your foot type and getting measured. So, a high arch foot fits differently than a lower arch foot. Match your shoe with your activity. Okay. Pick the pair that feels right. Okay. Different manufacturers, a different size uh, might be different, uh, might fit you more. You, it's not uncommon to have a shoe size, it's a size uh, difference between manufacturers. So you might be a size 10 in one make and a size 11 in another. Uh, consider uh, specialty stores. Online buying is uh, certainly uh, very much of today's culture. As long as there's a good ample return policy, I think that's certainly fine to do. Like replacing your shoes when they're worn, very important with runners. That's a whole uh, extra topic. So uh, certainly our healthy feet are very important to a healthy lifestyle. And we think that healthy feet are certainly the foundation for healthy living. So uh, with that, I'll apologize for the technical difficulties. We're not sure what happened there, um, but um, we'll, uh, we'll go to questions now. So I think... Um, okay. If I have Heather back with us. Yes. Yeah. Can yeah, you hear okay. me? Very good. Very good. Okay. All Great. Right. So, so your, first, so your question first question is, is, is laser treatment for toenail fungus painful? Is it painful? That's a good question. It's a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, we do not anesthetize toes. Uh, we need that feedback. So as we're doing toenail fungal treatment, we need to know if the patient is uncomfortable or not. Now, it's uh, something that is not permanent. So it's a transient uh, discomfort that happens. So as we're lasering across that nail bed, it might get a little bit warm, slightly uncomfortably, in which case we just kind of back off and move on to other toes. We do a technique where we massage the toe itself that dissipates heat, but there is no lasting uh, pain. There's no lasting ill effects from laser. Um, it's almost as if you uh, kind of... Uh, or running your hands under warm water and they've got just a little bit warmer, almost uncomfortably so, that you had to pull away. And that's how we that's how we handle uh, laser treatment for toenail fungus. Now, if we're lasering warts, warts are uncomfortable uh, when we use that setting. So we do typically anesthetize the area with the local anesthetic, or we use an ice bag and ice down the area in between quick zaps. It's a very quick procedure when we're doing uh, laser treatment for, uh, for plant warts. How do I get ingrown toenails? So typically it's from trimming your toenail a little bit more rounded and a little bit too close. So we try to avoid excessive rounding when we trim our toenails. So uh, rounding a little bit is acceptable, um, but rounding too much, that is a large part of why we get ingrown toenails. Ill fitting shoe gear, shoes that are too tight, activities, genetic predilection, sometimes we have a propensity for that toenail to just go down and in, and there's not a whole lot we can do to prevent that, in which case we have to do a little minor surgery that we showed in the presentation earlier. Can that surgery be done in the office, or does it have, do I have to go to a hospital or an um, ASC? Typically, the uh, toenail surgery, unless someone really doesn't like the idea of a local injection, this is 
the overwhelming majority of patients have their uh, toenail surgery uh, in the office and they do just fine. If folks have multiple ingrown toenails, it's a lot of local anesthetic to administer and that's several shots. So then we suggest doing that outpatient at a surgery center or hospital setting where the patient can be sedated, undergo either a light general anesthetic or something that we call monitored anesthesia care where they're um, under twilight and then we can numb the area up to work again. But overwhelming majority, even kids, I do just fine in the office. Think again, think like a dental procedure, except it's a toe, not, not a tooth. How effective is laser treatment for toenail fungus? Okay, uh, very good question. So uh, the literature will show various degrees of effectiveness, but it's also kind of apples to kiwis, if you will. So certain lasers, although indicated for toenail fungus treatment, not all are equal across the board. So our device uh, is a very effective uh, device, well published on. So in my hands, what I have seen is an 85% to 90% significant improvement. So we might not get complete uh, normal nail plate after treatment, but we'll get a significant improvement. So as an example, if I can use this analogy, someone has 10 toenails that are affected significantly, eight to nine of them are very significantly better. And of the little bit that's left in those couple toenails, it's still a significant improvement, in which case we can repeat or we can do some other things. But uh, with toenail fungus, it's very important to treat it early because again, we can get damage to that nail plate. And even though we clear the fungus itself, we'll have damaged toenail that will look deformed. So very uh, important to treat early on. Also, I referenced uh, combination therapy, so doing oral medication with laser, or most common that we see in patients like this quite a bit, as do I, and I recommend laser with topical. So that synergistic um, approach, we have a, uh, um, a physical modality with the laser, and then we have a pharmacological modality with the topical. It's very effective, which bumps our, our, our treatment outcome and our effectiveness uh, is significant. So I would say 90 to 95% of those patients are remarkably uh, improved, if not completely. Can bunions be treated without surgery? Only to accommodate the deformity. So there's really no way to uh, splint or to use uh, stretching to put that joint back. You might get a little bit of improvement, the function of the joint, you know, the great toe joint that's affected by the, um, the bunion deformity itself, that malalignment might feel a little bit better, but really the only way to get this uh, condition um, uh, treated uh, to get rid of it is surgery. That's aligning uh, that great toe joint. If we're talking about hammer toes, it's reducing that contracture. So it can, we can treat the symptoms, but we really can't. Uh, correct the deformity um, without surgery. Now, a mild to moderate bunion uh, deformed people do just fine and live uh, healthy, productive, very active lives for many, many, many years um, if they, they do some activity modification and shoot their modification, but no way to completely correct the deformity uh, other than surgery. Can you have corns and calluses permanently removed? That's a great question. Every now and then, they have a patient that says, can you just cut this out and just get rid of it so it's all the way better? Uh, we don't have to deal with this. We could, but the reason, as referenced earlier, we're getting that it's a condition of pressure, of friction, your biomechanics. So unless we correct the biomechanical reason why you're getting pressure, then that corner callus will keep coming back. Example, ill-fitting shoe gear. So it's kind of a simplistic example, but let's say you have too tight of a shoe in the, in the shoe box and it rubs on your small toe on your right foot. Well, we shave the corn down, we put those same pair of shoes on, and in several days, you're going to get that corn again because that's the body's response to friction, thickening um, that, that tissue so it doesn't ulcerate. So the answer is yes, we can permanently remove corns and calluses by shaving them down, but the real secret is preventing the uh, offending reason from causing the problem in the first place. So if you have a crooked toe, we have to correct the toe. If it's shoe gear that's ill-fitting, we have to get proper fitting shoe gear. Do you need surgery for heel spurs? 
uh, referencing uh, Joe DiMaggio, okay? Um, again, uh, that heel spur was sort of the beginning of the end of his career. He had surgery on the spur, and that caused this painful uh, scar. So playing baseball after that certainly wasn't fun and not easy uh, uh, for uh, Mr. DiMaggio. Um, so with plantar fasciitis, um, we talked about that most people respond very well to conservative means, non-operative. So injection therapy, anti-inflammatories, stretching, correcting those biomechanics, that contracture of the heel uh, cord, that Achilles, having a more limbal, limber foot helps substantially. If you have a heel spur, it's a result of the problem, not the cause. So that pulling of the plantar fascia on the heel will cause that bony growth. So there's no surgical reason to remove the heel spur. That just stays there. I've had patients that are asymptomatic that have very large spurs that had plantar fasciitis in the past. Now are better are people that are really very uncomfortable that have no heel spur at all that are early on in their plantar fasciitis uh, treatment. Um, in my uh, opinion, and uh, what I have seen over the years, uh, left untreated, well, not necessarily untreated, but if plantar fasciitis becomes chronic, even with treatment, you can get a little bit of bone growth on that heel, but there's no reason to uh, do surgery for that. So this, we're talking about heel spurs on the bottom of the foot. Now, uh, I don't believe I did talk about this. If you have a heel spur on the back of the heel that grows up and into the Achilles tendon, that's certainly a different problem. That can affect the health of that Achilles. That may require surgery. So we can change how the foot functions with conservative means, doing an orthotic, doing a little heel lift. That will change how the Achilles pulls on that heel. But if that heel spur is constantly digging into that Achilles, then we need to do something surgically. That's a different type of heel spur, which I don't believe I talked about earlier. So a plantar fasciitis heel spur, no surgical reason remove that. We can treat the, the fascia itself, the fasciitis with inflammation, but a uh, what we call retrocalcaneal behind the heel, uh, heel spur that affects the Achilles head. That's a different story. Can the laser burn your toenail? It gets a little bit warm. Um, to do that sort of damage, I literally would probably have to lasso the patient down to the treatment table, which we would never ever do. Uh, we have that uh, that feedback, uh, instantaneous feedback on uh, the patient and that discomfort level. So we just get off of that toe and go to another one. That massage technique dissipates the heat and uh, never is this uh, long lasting. It's a few seconds and then it's over. With. But we do need to get uh, up to temperature to have the laser be effective to destroy that nail fungus. How expensive is Caraflex and how often do you need to repeat it? Okay, so um, Carry Flex is a temporary toenail that you apply, okay, to the nail plate. It's strictly cosmetic. It's two uh, months about, so every uh, six to eight weeks. As the toenail grows a little bit, it uh, will push out and then it breaks the seal. We use a sealant to protect this. You can swim with it, bathe with it, et cetera. So about every six to eight weeks. Have patients go a little bit longer. Um, if you think about a salon uh, gel nail, it's a little bit more expensive than that. So if you have a, a full pedicure, you would look at an investment like that. And that price varies, if you will. So uh, depending, you could have pedicures that can cost $60, $80, $100. Uh, our, our pricing, we believe, is competitive. So um, I uh, candidly stay out of the financial discussion. We'd be happy to discuss this with you if you phone the office. Is athlete's foot contagious? That's very contagious, yes. Versus um, a toenail fungus, which I referenced earlier, a toenail fungus can be a reservoir for athlete's foot and vice versa. Athlete's foot is very catchy and you have to be cognizant of folks in your house have this, wiping down showers, common showers, et cetera, and treating this. So um, that can spread easier. Now, with that said, you don't have to be completely paranoid about going barefoot. Um, it's actually good to let your feet breathe and do uh, natural motions without shoes on, but like a gym shower floor, that common area where there's a lot of feet moving around, that would be an area that you're going to be more predisposed to uh, picking up uh, fungal infection in the skin. So yes, that is contagious. 
How do you prevent ingrown toenails? Proper trimming of your toenails. So uh, avoid that excessive rounding, uh, trimming more straight, straight across. Sometimes we can't outmaneuver our genetics. Some of us might be predisposed to uh, an ingrown toenail. Um, Ill-fitting shoes, tight-fitting shoes in a toe box, that's also a, a reason for uh, ingrown toenails. Do plantar warts come back? They can, okay. In which case we can retreat with different uh, modalities. Uh, most often though, when we treat uh, more on the aggressive side with laser, uh, with a topical, um, or we do an excision, the recurrence rate is pretty low. I'd say probably out of every 10 plantar war patients I treat, um, more like probably every 20 I treat, I might have to redo one to two. Do night splints work to correct a bunion? So they can help reduce symptoms. They can't align that joint. Now, sometimes we do splinting after bunion surgery. It's not always necessary, but some surgeons do. Um, they can't correct and align the joint again. So you really can't put that joint back with conservative means. You need surgery. That was our last question. Does anyone have any additional questions that they'd like to type into the Q&A box? No? Well, thank you very much, Dr. Napolitano. Thank you, Heather. Thank you everyone for taking some time tonight and I wish everyone a good rest of the week. And if you're traveling, when the weather gets warmer, Remember to take care of your feet and uh, travel safely. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Our next webinar will be held on May 2nd. Dr. Scott Smith will be speaking on shoulder pain and rotator cuff injuries. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Good night.